I was listening to a running podcast a while ago, and this particular podcast was about how to be a lifelong runner. Now, I expected that the expert in this podcast would probably have some nutrition advice for me. I also expected to feel lightly shamed into taking stretching a little more seriously, not my favorite part of running. But it turns out that the number one thing that you need to do in order to be a lifelong runner is you need to be a lifelong learner. You need to be open to learning from the unfolding science and wisdom of the community of runners around you. You need to be att attentive and adaptable to the fact that you are running in a changing body and a body that is growing older. You need to be able to deal with injury. Injury is part of running. And so you need to learn to be attentive to what pain has to teach you about what needs to change, what needs to be different, so that you can lace up your shoes and so that you can take another step forward. I know that I talk about running a lot. I don't talk about running a lot because I assume that all of you are into running. I talk about running a lot because I hope that you can see that there's a metaphor here. There's a metaphor here that applies much more widely than just to runners. It applies to us as human beings, and I would say in particular, it applies to us as people of faith. Now, I'm going to tell you that it is baked into the DNA of what it is to be a Christian to be a lifelong learner. That is literally what a disciple is. A disciple is very simply a student. A disciple is somebody who shows up ready to learn. So last week in our gospel passage, we heard about Jesus calling his first disciples, his first students. And it makes sense that then this week, we would hear Jesus begin to teach them. This is, in fact, part of a very well-known, famous teaching of Jesus, fondly called the Sermon on the Mount. And I'll give you a heads up that we're going to be looking at some of the other parts of the Sermon on the Mount in the, couple, the coming weeks. But today we start with arguably the most well-known of the teachings from the Sermon on the Mount, and this is called the Beatitudes. The blessed are those who statements. Now, I've heard a lot of sermons over the years on the Beatitudes, and often those sermons focus on some economic realities that are implicated by Jesus' words of blessing. If we talk about Jesus' blessing being aligned with the impoverished and the dispossessed, then that tells us something of significance about how we are to be part of bringing the world more in line with the vision of the kingdom of God. And that does have profound consequences for us about our relationship with money, about our relationship with resources, about how we might need to give of some of what we have away in order to better shape the world in the shape of God's kingdom. And... These words should particularly challenge us in this time and place, which even when we're in times of economic hardship, is still the most materially wealthy time and place of all of history. I don't dispute that these are real challenges that come out of today's gospel passage and out of this particular set of teachings. 
But I want to shift our perspective today. And I want to ask the question, what do Jesus' words here have to teach us about ourselves? Because certainly there is something in these words about how the landscape of the world around us needs to be reordered so that everybody has enough. But also there is something here about the landscape of the human heart. Something about the common ground of the human experience. And I would hazard a guess that this is maybe part of the reason why these are some of Jesus' better known teachings. Is because when we hear him talk about God's blessings across all of these different circumstances, maybe we find that there's something here to which we can relate. Something that talks about our experience as well. In fact, it is the case that each and every one of us as human beings knows what it is to hunger. We know what it is to need food and companionship from outside of ourselves in order that we ourselves can live. Many of us at one time or another know what it is to address our hunger in ways that don't always feed us and don't always give us life. Many of us know what it is to look at the world around us and to see a vision of how that world can be better, how our world can be a place of peace and mercy. And many of us strive to be part of how that world is better to make choices that contribute to goodness and light and meaning in the world around us, even if we don't always know how to do that. Many of us at one time or another will know what it is to stand up for what we believe in and to have those beliefs rejected. Many of us at one time or another will know what it is to feel rejected ourselves. All of us, I would dare to say, know what it is at one time or another to be injured. We know what it is to suffer heartbreak, hurt, loss, that feels like it breaks us in two. And we don't exactly know how to recover, and we don't exactly know how to move forward. So what does it mean to say that God's blessings are present, that we are blessed across this landscape of the human heart, across all of those complexities of our human experience? What do we see of the blessings of God in our longing, in our difficulty, in our pain, in our uncertainty, when we show up ready to learn? I'm going to offer three potential learnings, takeaways from Jesus' words today. You could no doubt, and I encourage you to do so, you could add to this list. Learnings that you hear, teachings, takeaways that you hear in Jesus' words of blessing today. I'm going to stick to a Trinitarian three. Number one, we learn how not to be alone. To say that God blesses us in the midst of our difficulty or uncertainty, when we come to those crossroads in the road, when we're struggling to figure out the step forward, is to say that we don't have to go it alone. That we can lean into the resource of prayer and we can certainly lean into the resource of the community of faith, the wisdom of those who went before us, the wisdom of those who are beside us. We can assume 
that God is going to offer light to guide our next step and that we don't have to figure it out by ourselves. We learn how not to be alone. Number two, we learn how to look with expectation for how God is going to act. Because what I hear in these words is a very clear promise that there is no circumstance of our human lives through which God will not only be present, but also through which God can operate with blessing. That is not to say that God causes bad things to happen in order to teach us or to test us, but it is to say that God never abandons us. And that no matter what happens to us, no matter what difficult, painful circumstances we find ourselves in, we can learn how to keep our eyes open to where God's love and light and healing is also going to shine and is going to be revealed in any of the cracks, in any of the broken pieces of our lives. We learn how to keep our eyes open to the presence of God. Number three, and maybe this is the most important, we learn how to be compassionate. Because if God is at work in the mess of my life, then I have to admit that God is also at work in the mess of your life. And I don't know how many times I have been distressed or confounded by the behavior of somebody else, only to find out that they are operating out of past pain or out of current insecurity in ways that, if I'm being honest, I know something about too. I also know something about insecurity, and I also know something about past pain. And if I am going to get better at looking for how God shows up in the cracks and pain and difficulty of my life, then I also need to grow in the ways of patience and understanding and looking for how God is going to show up in all of the circumstances of your life as well. To be a disciple, to be a student of faith, is to be somebody who continually learns about the way of compassion. There's another term from running that we use in order to talk about this habit of lifelong learning and it's called beginner's mind. So when you lace up your shoes to go out the door for a run, you start with the attitude that most of what there is to know is still in front of you, not behind you. And somehow that beginner's mind, that habit of lifelong learning allows us to run with less loneliness and with more joy. It allows us to be injured. It allows us to feel pain. It allows us to come through that pain, not the same, but changed and ready to take another step forward. I don't think I need to really explain how that is a metaphor not just for runners, but for all of us. Amen. <laughs>